So the resolution for LD 2020 March April topic is resolved. Predictive policing is unjust. Um, so for this entire analysis, I just have a simple agenda here. We're going to be going over initially definitions, observations, framing, and then things to keep in mind, just general stuff, as well as then moving on to off contention level arguments, off frameworks, so how to use those contentions, neg contention level arguments, and then neg frameworks. So let's jump right in. So definitions. This topic is actually pretty straightforward. Um, it has like, what, five words in the resolution. The only phrase you'll really need to define is predictive policing. And this definition comes from Brain et al. 2015. And they define predictive policing. And this is a very common definition, by the way. You'll see this in research a lot. This is commonly referred to. And I think, I think it, in fact, it comes from that 2013 RAND report that the study uh, mentions here. Um, but it's used across a lot of literature. So what predictive policing is, according to a lot of the literature, is, quote, predictive policing refers to the use of analytical techniques by law enforcement to make statistical predictions about potential criminal activity. Predictive policing can involve either predicting events, i.e. forecasting when and where crimes are likely to occur, or people, i.e. individuals likely to be victims or perpetrators of crime. Instead of relying on an officer's hunch or about area, predictive policing uses the power of, quote, big data to isolate patterns, end quote. So a 2013 RAND report goes on to list four categories of predictive policing going off of that definition. First is methods for predicting crime. Second is methods for predicting offenders. Third is methods for predicting perpetrators identities and then fourth is methods for predicting victims and now all of these are definitely very topical so you can choose to make the stance that we one of these or all four of these are bad on the affirmative and then on the negative that one of these or all four of these or two three whatever are good you, you can make as as little attachment to all four of these standards or as much as you'd like so moving on to observations and framing and really what you should know about the topic. So first things first, I think how you take the resolution and how the resolution of like predictive, the topic of predictive policing rather is implemented matters. And the reason for that is because predictive policing in theory might have some problems, but you might find a lot less problems and it might not even be a problem under your standard or framework if it works out in theory, right? Because like in theory, it might not have a lot of the bad implications that it does have in practice. So setting up this dichotomy of in theory versus in practice could be very strategic. So I would argue that affirmatives should take the stance that they should analyze the resolution and predictive policing more specifically how it is used in practice. Because A, maybe ethics isn't actually applicable if we talk about it only in the abstract. We have to analyze ethics and how it applies to the real world. But B, in practice, predictive policing is a lot more different than it is in theory. Negs can go either way. Negs can also make the argument that in practice, it's implemented a ton of different ways across a ton of different countries. So we don't really know what it looks like in practice. Therefore, we ought to default to what it looks like in theory or like a general standard of what predictive policing looks like. Um, because of this, I think that setting up these dichotomies might be helpful. It might be helpful to try to argue that we should look at how predictive policing plays out in the real world, or it might be helpful to argue that we should look at it more abstractly because that's the only like more objective measure since countries implemented differently. I think that this will be definitely very relevant to the topic um, and something to consider when writing your cases. So then, Next, uh, talking about burdens. So I think that's also equally as important. I think that the AF can take a couple of different positions in terms of their burdens. They can either advocate that predictive policing as a concept is like inherently intrinsically problematic um, and that in and of itself makes it unjust, or they can argue that holistically we ought to 
evaluate predictive policing on net, right? So if on net it produces harms, if on net it is um, bad or produces bad consequences or whatever your standard would be, right? Um, if on net it violates that, then it is unjust. Whereas uh, alternatively, the neg can argue and it might be very strategic for the neg to argue this, that all they have to do is show one instance of predictive policing working and being good and like producing good results or like again upholding whatever standard that they choose to uphold in the round like with their framework um if they can show that they've done that with like maybe one instance two instances instances they might be more niche um points then they could argue that that that's enough reason to show that it is not unjust entirely so whether it's unjust on net or unjust like holistically um those are two different kinds of ways you can view burdens and i think that preparing for what you have to prove as a debater is really important when you're writing your case so the last thing to keep in mind on this slide is about paradigms um and this is important if you're trying to think about the resolution maybe in a more strategic way in terms of what you can do with framing so there are two different ways you could frame the resolution here. You can do it through a comparative worlds lens or truth testing lens. <clears throat> and so for those of you who don't know, I'll explain what both of these are. So comparative worlds says that we ought to look at and compare the worlds that the affirmative would look like and that the negative would look like, right? And we choose whatever world uh, is better to live in, right? So oftentimes you'll hear debaters um, like say something like judge, like what kind of world do you want to live in? One with like terrorism or one without terrorism, you know, bad example, but like that's the point is it compares the different worlds in the different scenarios that would play out in those worlds. Truth testing, however, just says I don't really have to show that my world is better or worse. I just have to prove the resolution true or false. So I'm testing the resolution to see if it is a true statement. Um, and because of this, truth testing works really well with categorical frameworks, right? Deontic frameworks, ones that look at standards or principles and says, predictive policing for example violates that standard it violates that principle and therefore it like is um it is untrue that it is just right it is false that it is just or whatever uh, phrasing you would use there um but we'll get into some examples of comparative worlds versus truth testing when we talk about frameworks that's a little bit um if you're not familiar with the concept it might be a little bit hard to wrap your head around without some examples so Moving on to framing uh, more generally speaking um, and less like about specifically debate. So a couple of things to keep in mind. This resolution is not U.S. centric. So you have to think about what the implications of this are if it's not U.S. centric. So I would argue that because it's not U.S. centric, anything that any government that we're talking about like authoritarian regimes dictatorships those are all fair game and you have to think about the implications of those kinds of regimes having this predictive policing uh kind of law enforcement available to them and that might broaden the scope of kinds of arguments you can make so then moving on to what kind of model of criminal justice this topic is really pinpointing so in criminal justice literature there are two prevalent forms and like models for how the justice system ought work so the first is the crime control model which tells us that we should strive to reduce crime that's the primary goal of the criminal justice system its goal is to reduce crime and prevent crime when it can alternatively the other very prominent model of criminal justice is the due process model which says no the goal of the criminal justice system is not to reduce crime but rather it is to protect rights and liberties so that's why we would want to prosecute people who violate people's rights and liberties and it's also why the government must go through this extensive process to show that a person is actually guilty and that they have an obligation to make it as hard as possible to convict people.
And now I think that in and of itself, knowing what side you're defending um, is really important for a criminal justice topic, though I think you can be defending both in certain instances. But more importantly, if you wanted to take a, a negative position, for example, that focuses very much on like the reduction of crime, then you can find a lot of framework justifications and justifications for your standard um, via literature about crime control model of criminal justice. Alternatively, if you wanted to have a framework of due process on the affirmative or something along those lines, then you could also find good justifications for that through this um, like due process model of criminal justice research. So I think this can just be like a gateway towards justifications for like very specific criminal justice kinds of stances one might take on this topic. And then the last thing to keep in mind is that normally NSDA topics that are based on criminal justice are rehabilitative versus retributive, right? So they pose this dichotomy where one side is advocating for a rehabilitative form of justice, whereas the other side is advocating for a retributive form of justice. That's not true in this topic. So this topic, the NEG can advocate for rehabilitative or re retributive justice or both. It's totally plausible that they can do either. And so understanding what kind of side and what kind of like definition of justice you would be defending, I think is also equally important. So let's move on to understanding the actor. So who is the actor in the resolution? We talked a little bit about it earlier. Obviously, the United States is not the actor, but who is the actor? Well, I would say law enforcement is the actor in the resolution, right? Because they're the one doing the policing, um, if there's any actor at all. So because law enforcement is the actor in the resolution, they are also an extension of the government. So that means that when we're talking about frameworks, standards, any kind of like philosophy that is based in governmental obligations and like those theories of government are totally fair game. They're totally relevant to this topic. Um, so you have criminal justice kinds of frameworks and standards you could pursue, or you can just have more broadly uh, standards that like are like an extension of what a government ought to do. Because again, law enforcement is an extension of the government. So then I would also say that this, because law enforcement is the actor and they are an extension of the government, excludes theories of ethics that focus on the individual. So like the categorical imperative, virtue ethics, etc. Those just aren't relevant to this topic. We're talking about what a, a specific like sort of branch of government would do here, not what an individual would do. And so m keeping that in mind can help inform your case writing. So a couple of things to remember. First, Half. inherency is important here so what i mean by that you are going to probably hear a lot of different applications of what predictive policing looks like and it's important that your advocacy show that predictive policing regardless of the interpretation is unjust so you have to point out problems with predictive policing that are inherent or intrinsic to predictive policing or you have to you know win that kind of framework debate that we had a little bit earlier about like burdens neg you don't have to advocate for the status quo you don't have to advocate for how predictive policing is currently used you can advocate for one specific instance of predictive policing or one specific usage of predictive policing remember negate means to prove false that's really important and also you can make a really powerful argument by pointing out that hey, there is no one set standard for what predictive policing looks like, right? It's implemented across different countries very differently depending on that country and depending on that system. So because of that, there's really no norm. So maybe NEG doesn't have a specific like norm that they would be attached to. So if affirmative says like there's a problem with predictive policing and you say like, well, no, that wasn't a problem in like Germany, for example, when they used predictive policing, then I would say that that's probably fair game right? That's probably within the grounds of the negative uh, like stance to be able to say like, no, I don't have to defend like your interpretation of predictive policing. I can defend a interpretation of predictive policing and, and a impl implementation of predictive policing, not the one that the affirmative sets out. So last thing to keep in mind before we hop into the arguments, 
predictive analysis studies in general will actually be very applicable to this topic. So if you don't know, predictive analysis studies are just like essentially um, analyses that talk about like being able to predict things to begin with, right? So it's based on like algorithms. So that's what like predictive policing is based on, right? So predictive policing uses predictive analysis in policing. So predictive analysis is just like a broader umbrella that policing falls under. Um, and you can definitely find a lot of empirics that might be showing how predictive analysis can be problematic or beneficial. And that can definitely be extrapolated to predictive policing. Though I'm not sure if it's super necessary because this topic already has a good amount of literature on it. So let's move on to the affirmative level contentions. So first things first, inaccurate and false data. Um, it's important to note like whether the data that builds these algorithms is actually accurate and actually true. So one of the things you should research is how often is data false or inaccurate? How effective is the data once we know it is false or inaccurate? Um, and keeping these things in mind and being able to prepare for arguments about bad false data or maybe even throwing it into your case is actually, I think, really beneficial. So here we have a card from Richardson et al. 2019 who writes, Law enforcement agencies are increasingly using predictive policing systems, yet in numerous jurisdictions, these systems are built on data produced during documented periods of flawed racially biased and sometimes unlawful practices and pol policies. This is known as dirty policing. The methodology by which data is created raises the risk of creating inaccurate, skewed, or systematically biased data. This is known as dirty data. So keeping all of this in mind, this is just one card. Obviously, you should do your own research and find out some of those tidbits that I mentioned earlier about how uh, how often this kind of data is actually false or inaccurate and maybe more why it's false or inaccurate um, because it gives a kind of like a brief general rundown of a few ideas but can go more in depth on like why those uh, documented periods were flawed to begin with um, but recognizing that the data itself can sometimes start out flawed can kind of lead to almost a fruit of the poisonous tree argument where it's like yeah if the data starts out bad then anything that comes after that data is going to be bad so the algorithm that comes after that data is going to be problematic and lead to perhaps inaccurate or biased data uh, what is referenced here as dirty data so before we get any further just to to clarify down in the description box below we will have a google doc that you will be able to open it's open to the public that has all of the cards that we use in this powerpoint so they're already cut they're cut exactly how we cut them here with the tags and everything so if you want to go see some of these cards if you want to take this card if you want to use it in your case go ahead and click that google doc in the description box below and you can use that. That'll be true again for all of the cards in this PowerPoint. So let's move on to more contention level arguments. So the next contention level argument that kind of plays off of the first one for sure, and I think it's probably the most common argument you're going to see on this topic, is stereotyping, profiling, racism, discrimination in general. So important thing to remember, machine learning can be racist. And the reason it can be racist is because, well, one of the many reasons is because it's built on already skewed data a lot of the times. So that goes back to the dirty data point we were making. So that can really set up and warrant why this machine learning can be racist. So what happens is if, for example, the data comes in and it's already skewed in certain ways. So let me explain what I mean by skewed. So if the data comes in and it ha we collected this data, for example, on who commits certain kinds of crimes in a particular city the most and it happened at a point in history maybe where a certain race was being targeted more where perhaps a certain uh, a certain group was being targeted more by law enforcement or as victims right then that might lead to skewed data 
It also could be the case that certain regions might be more heavily, like, uh, have higher levels of crime at one period, and then, like, maybe that ent- that changed entirely, and so that data is now inaccurate, it's skewed. It tells a different story than the reality of what it looks like now. Um, so skewed data is definitely a problem and there's a lot of literature now my explanation of that is very subpar and there's a lot of literature out there that talks about skewed data and how it is racially biased so one of the cards here comes from O'Donnell 19 who writes algorithms are capable of racism predictive policing algorithms are trained on data that is heavily influenced or heavily infected rather with racism because the data is generated by human beings Predictive policing algorithms are coded to delineate patterns in massive data sets and subsequently dictate who or where to police. Because of the realities of criminal justice systems, a salient pattern emerges from the racially skewed data. Race is associated with criminality. In this way, machine learning algorithms are capable of perpetuating racist policing. Now, again, this is just a starting point. You should do your own research and continue to find more cards on this and actually understand how machine learning can be racist and mostly it's going to be built on that skewed data right so um and then also how those algorithms can continue to perpetuate that but i think that this is going to be a very common argument on the topic and it's going to be i would say very uh, prevalent and there's a lot of research that supports this there in terms of the literature on the topic this is probably the leading reason uh, why people critique predictive policing so at the very least if you're not going to run this you should be very prepared to argue against this and to defend this problem of predictive policing or to disprove it so in terms of the impacts of that kind of discrimination i think that there are two really cool impacts you could take the first has to do with the legitimization of that kind of stereotyping and racism so moving on to another contention level argument that i anticipate seeing a lot privacy and surveillance right so i would say that at the point where predictive policing is using algorithms to detect people's behavior and like their predicted behavior and then it's definitely a breach of privacy, um, especially because officers are going to use this and try to target specific people more because of it. So I actually got this card from, I think it's called Kinky Briefs. Um, and I really support what they do because they give out free briefs all the time, which is super awesome and really helpful to small schools or poor um, students or both. Um, so I think that's really awesome and shout out to them. But I think this card is really cool and it articulates how predictive policing because it's talking about predictive policing specifically is an erosion of privacy and i think that that is really cool and it talks a little bit about this sort of chilling effect that occurs when people feel like they're constantly being observed it can not only create like a mistrust between society and the government but leads to what is known as self-censorship right so they might um people would this is not a might thing they do there are many studies that talk about this they will act differently because they are afraid of being that they're being surveyed and i think that's a really interesting argument that has a ton of different implications especially if you're going to do uh maybe some kind of framework that's based on like a democracy or conception or like a liberal democracy conception of rights so moving on to another contention level argument has to do with structural violence and also that first argument we talked about also had to do with structural violence but i think this one is really interesting because keeping in mind what we talked about earlier about who is the actor it's not just liberal democracies who are states who use predictive policing right we're talking about authoritarian regimes we're talking about dictatorships that have access to predictive policing and use it and they can use it to not only oppress minorities um within their country right so whether that's like ethnic minorities religious minorities um any kind of minority in that region women etc they can also use predictive policing to do what is known as protest policing which is essentially they can specifically 
predict, preempt, and respond to protests in real time. That's what this kind of data allows governments to do. So it can allow them to quell dissenters and uprisings as they're happening or before they're happening and suppress this kind of nonconformist opinion. So Densenik 17 writes, Big data uses proactive forms of governance in which state bodies engage in analysis to predict preemptive and respond to predict preempt and respond in real time to a range of social problems. We contextualize these algorithmic processes within actual police practices focusing on protest policing. So I think this is really interesting. I think it could have a ton of implications for um countries again who are authoritarian who are dictators who um might actively use violence against their people in response to uh this kind of protest policing and i think that's really interesting and definitely falls under the scope of the resolution so that might be something you want to explore so another argument that I think is probably going to be a little bit common on this topic is going to be about accountability. And there are a ton of different ways you can take this argument to. But I think the most interesting has to do with like um, almost a historical like concept of what accountability in law enforcement looks like. And like newsflash, there really isn't much. Um, for those of you who have been around LD for a decent amount of time, I think this would be seniors. Um, you might remember the qualified immunity topic which was like i think three four years ago and the qualified immunity topic was just just like should police officers be able to be sued and the answer is with qualified immunity they're not so police officers really don't see that much accountability and what predictive policing does is it allows uh, police officers to escape accountability even further right because they can blame the data for maybe their racist or discriminatory policing right so they can say rather than actually taking accountability for the department being racist they can say it's not us it's the data right it's the algorithms that are telling us to pr uh, go police these minority areas even more even though that algorithm is racist in and of itself it allows them to refer to quote science or quote like statistics and data in order to be able to show and demonstrate that like they're not the ones that are racist um, and it allows them to escape accountability. And I think that could have good implications even for like social movements, perhaps. I think that could be really interesting. So the last contention level argument we're going to talk about for the affirmative is the effectiveness of like the reduction in crime. So I think that this is going to be probably a big area of clash on this topic, right? Because I think a lot of the main literature for the neg goes and talks about like how predictive policing can actually reduce crime i think that's probably where most people's minds go when they hear the topic so i think that you're going to see a lot of clash here and i think affirmatives should either be able to preempt this in case by showing that it actually increases crime or it's not effective so it's not worth the benefits or just saving it for a rebuttal but i think that this is an interesting uh interesting couple cards that you should have on hand or something very similar so your goal here should be as the affirmative to eliminate or really reduce the perceived benefit from predictive policing so what we have here for you is two different cards the Meyer 19 one is just an empirical um observation that goes over like different uh evidence on predictive policing and finds that there's like little support for the clean benefits of predictive policing and that it actually tends to be based on kind of convincing analytical arguments and anecdotal evidence rather than on systematic empirical research so i think that could be really interesting to try kind of say like no these benefits that the neg talks about aren't actually existent then there's Gersten Grinster, 18, who is uh, completing like a, a case study, I think it's in Germany, of predictive policing. And really what they find is, despite some positive findings, the impact on crime remains unclear and the size of crime reduction effects appear to be moderate. So they're still not really sure about the actual effects that predictive policing have on crime, but even in this particular study, what they found, it wasn't like that great, wasn't that substantial. So you can minimize that argument here. And there's definitely a lot more research on this topic, on the, specifically on like crime reduction. So I would definitely encourage you to go out and research it, to go out and find it, 
and to use it because and to be prepared on either side for this debate because i think that this is going to be also another big level of clash especially for traditional circuits so let's move on to frameworks for the affirmative so for the rest of this topic analysis i'm not going to be talking about like values um for traditional circuits because the resolution prescribes the a notion of justice right it uses the word unjust so most rounds are most likely going to default to justice and i, I actually think that this is probably for traditional circuits the better way to go because it's going to be pretty hard to convince a lay judge for example that we ought to value something else when justice is clearly the most topical and it's prescribed in the resolution so i think rounds will likely then focus down to criterions and standards and because of that that's what we're going to focus on in this topic analysis so first framework structural oppression and structural violence so we talked about those impacts to minority groups people of color um islamophobia is another uh, big area on the topic because of the neg might argue we use predictive policing for terroristic uh, efforts um it definitely hurts low-income folks more so because of that it definitely disproportionately impacts these kinds of minority groups and disadvantaged groups and so that could work really well under a structural oppression or structural violence framework um going back to the idea of like that dirty data inaccurate false data um again the link there is that it definitely hurts minorities and disadvantaged groups more because they bear the brunt of the effects from inaccurate data and then lastly having to do with those um protest policing issues that we talked about earlier so like being able to quell protesters and stop dissent before it happens i think that again would link really well to a structural violence and oppression framework so in case you're wondering um you might not have had any experience with um structural violence or structural oppression frameworks or you might not know how to run one that's fine. We have provided for all of the frameworks we talk about here, we really want to show you how you can actually run them, um, or for most of them rather. So for most of the frameworks we talk about here, we have cards um, and maybe a little bit of analysis explaining how you would run this. So here on structural violence or oppression, you might have a standard or a value criterion of something like minimizing structural violence or minimizing structural oppression um, or min minimizing oppression to begin with. So I think that that's, um, I hope that this is very helpful to people who might be interested in running structural violence, but don't really know how. So all of the cards, again, are linked in the doc in the description box below. So even the framework cards are there with the links, as you can see, they're cut exactly how we cut them here. So you can go ahead and use those if you are wondering how to actually run a structural violence or structural oppression framework. So next, this is just kind of a, a couple of like um, off the cuff ideas that I had that I think would be interesting to pursue. So first is a uh, due process framework in the affirmative. And I think that this would be a really cool, interesting categorical framework to pursue. I think that you can make a very persuasive argument about like innocence until proven guilty. Uh, so like a presumption of innocence kind of um a notion as a contention maybe have different standards of what due process looks like depending on your conception of due process and that could be really interesting on how predictive policing violates that so that could be a really interesting framework um then going to what we talked a little bit about earlier on the issue of privacy this idea of like liberal democracies and like their conception of rights so i think again the violation of the right to privacy would be super relevant here and also presumption of innocence um would be really relevant too so i think both of these things would work really well under some kind of um liberal rights scheme or some kind of like democracy um like liberal democracy um promotion idea so then the last uh, kind of philosophy framework that I think could be really interesting is libertarianism. Um, specifically here, Nozick, who talks about, Robert Nozick, who talks about the minimal state. I think that it could definitely be argued, and I think that this would be a very reasonable interpretation of Nozick, that it would be beyond the power and duty of the government to actively predict policing. Um, and I think that there is probably... Uh, a lot of reasons 
why he would be very against that um just just from what a government in terms of policing ought do to begin with so i think if you wanted to run libertarianism that could be a really interesting way to do it so then moving on to roles so i think that roles is going to be really common on this topic i don't think that it should be i think people probably just want to run something along the lines of like structural violence or structural oppression and if you do just run it because it's easier it's more simple than trying to defend roles but if you do want to run roles for whatever reason um i think there are two different ways you can do it so obviously you would want to use roles as two principles that's the best way to run roles as domestic philosophy um especially on a traditional circuit so his first uh principle which is the liberty principle keeping in mind that they come in lexical order which just means that the liberty principle comes first so if something may promote or benefit the difference principle it doesn't matter if it violates the liberty principle it's lexical order liberty principle matters more so because of that you have to really have a good strong liberty principle argument here and so what he just means by the liberty principle by the way is just that governments need to create um systems of rights that allow for equal schemes of rights i think is the exact phrase he uses so people should not have there shouldn't be a difference in like allocation of rights so you can argue that that certain groups are having their rights and liberties violated again because it specifically targets minority groups i think that that could probably work really well under his liberty principle under his difference principle again this is just another way to run structural violence so everything we talked about under that like on that slide about structural violence and structural oppression would work really well here how do you run roles um you run roles by um i say using these two cards is probably a really good way to actually run roles um so his idea of justice as fairness maybe as like the value um and then the value criterion maybe something like consistency with roles as two principles of justice or upholding roles as two principles of justice using that second card that explains what these two principles of justice um it are so first each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive scheme of equal basic liberties compatible with a similar scheme of liberties for others so basically we need to maximize liberties for everyone without like infringing on other people's liberties but also that they have to be like equal right so uh, i can't have more liberties than another person and then second social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they are a reasonably expected to be to everyone's advantage and b attached to positions and offices open to all so again i think that most people are probably somewhat familiar with roles um at the very least the veil of ignorance i don't think that's the strongest way to go i don't think that's ever really a good way to run roles because it's not like a good standard right it's like it's a hypothetical thought experiment it doesn't give you a standard for the round whereas these two principles do especially because they're more concrete roles writes a lot about what they are and what they mean and how to use them and how they apply to policy too so because of that i think that this might be a really good way to go um if you were to want to run roles and you can use this framework again linked in the description so next these are just generic consequential and util frameworks so the neg pause here is just referring to negative and positive utilitarianism so negative utilitarianism for those of you who don't know just refers to like or negative you know consequentialism however you want to view it preventing bad consequences so um preventing harms would be like a, a sort of negative utility um and then positive utilitarianism would be like promoting good things whether that's based on um a, like a hedonistic calculation or preference-based utility either way it's just promoting something positive so then a couple of examples minimizing violence minimizing suffering maximizing expected well-being maximizing societal welfare these are all definitely plausible value criterions then i would say um again the generic standard card for those of you who aren't familiar with it is Waller 97 this is what most people use if they just want to justify a generic consequential framework so i think that that could be helpful to you again it's linked in the description so now let's move on to neg contention level arguments again we talked about this earlier the first thing is the reduction of crime i think that studies that talk about a reduction of crime and fatalities are going to be very prevalent here so um we have two particular studies here one is an empirical study 
um, that just looks at predictive policing and how it decreased fatalities from 2.9% up to 5% and crime incidents from 9.7% to the low end all the way up to 11.1%. So there are some statistical analyses on how predictive policing have been helpful and positive. Again, I think that you should definitely do your own research. There's way more research out there on predictive policing and crime. This is not meant to be like an extensive guide or a brief. So go ahead and do your own research. And then the second card gets the analytical warrant for why that occurs, right? So why this reduction in crime makes sense, the logical reason for why it occurs. And again, both of these cards will be linked in the description box below. Do your own research though. There's definitely a lot of research out here on how predictive policing reduces crime um and there's definitely a lot of warrants for why it does so i would highly encourage you to look into that so the next thing uh these are just a couple of arguments you can make first deterrence predictive policing can be used to deter criminals from acting it can also stop crime before it happens and then another argument you can make is because predictive policing allows for a specific allocation of police officers, it can reduce the need for officers. And studies have shown that predictive policing reduces needs for officers. So they can be used in a more strategic way and the impacts from that can be super duper beneficial. So neg level arguments on the contention level continue. So I think that these are niche uses for predictive policing that are pretty high impact. Um, and I think that these are probably more of the stronger route to go. So terrorism, drug trafficking, human trafficking, all of these are examples of uh, ways we can use predictive policing to specifically target high impact um, problems, high impact crimes. And this definitely falls under the scope of predictive policing because A, we're talking about law enforcement as the actor, right? So like the FBI totally falls under that. But not only that, the New York Police Department, for example, actually has a department, like a specific um, section of their police department dedicated to preventing terrorism. So I think it's super duper relevant to the topic. And I think that it's not obviously not just NYPD, LAPD. I think that there are a ton of examples you could have of police departments who actually do try to prevent these kinds of crimes, making it definitely topical. Um, and I think that this is a very interesting way to go again, because it's high impact. It allows you to perhaps outweigh on some of the arguments that the AF might make and show like very good benefits to society. So I think, and also you can make arguments with like drug trafficking and human trafficking. You can make arguments to like structural violence, right? So you could even try to link into some of the AF arguments. And I think that's really interesting. Another super interesting way to take this resolution is on promoting positive programs. So we don't necessarily have to use predictive policing to incarcerate people. We can use predictive policing to implement things like jobs programs and after school programs for at-risk youth. And the way that this works is it comes from a card from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. And this is talking specifically about predictive policing. But it says that, for an example, we can implement a jobs program in an identified crime hotspot to encourage legitimate rather than criminal pursuits or create after school programs for at risk youth. And I think that this is really interesting because it says that we can recognize maybe there's a specific region that a crime is more likely to be committed, that crime is, you know, again, it's a hot spot, that's what it's referred to, a region that has more crime and criminal activity. And we can implement positive programs to actually try to reduce that crime rather than trying to simply use predictive policing only to incarcerate and again that kind of goes up to one of those four uh, definitions or criteria of what predictive policing is and i think you could definitely make something like this work under that and i think it's really interesting because then you're advocating for not just positive programs but rehabilitative programs even so moving on to neg frameworks again same as we talked about under the affirmative generic consequential utilitarian frameworks um Wooler 97 again. Um, the only thing added here is like reducing crime, which is again a negative utility. Um, so that might be another standard you have if you're going for hard for reducing crime on the negative. I think that could be really um, topical and that could be another standard. <laughs> 
So another framework that you could run on the neg is rule of law, and it depends on your interpretation of rule of law and how you define it. But I think that it could work really well if you're arguing that the negative and predictive policing can help reduce crime and prevent and deter crime. And so that it also upholds and enforces the law in those two ways. And I think that that could be super duper relevant. And I think that rule of law is definitely an interesting way to go um, and an interesting way to take the red. So here, in case you didn't know, in case you wanted some ideas of how to run rule of law, this is two generic, um, I wouldn't call them super generic, but these are two standard cards that um, I think can really help um, just set you up in the right path for a rule of law framework. So just running these two cards of what the rule of law is and how it works and the implications it has for ideas of justice and the law are uh, definitely um good justifications for rule of law i think that maybe a value criterion of like consistency with rule of law or upholding the rule of law something along those lines would work really well so with that i think that another interesting way you can take the res is like a security and safety kind of value criterion like preserving security promoting safety something along those lines you can use those contentions we talked about earlier terrorism trafficking um, whether it's drug trafficking or human trafficking, they're a threat to the safety and security of everyone in society. And so because of that, um, we should have predictive policing. Um, and you can justify this kind of this standard with um, this card from Thomas Hobbes right here, um, which is just it essentially says like the reason we create the government in the first place is to um, promote the safety of the people right to ensure the safety of the people and that's why we create a government and that would be Hobbes's conception of why we create a government so because of that that kind of can justify that framework but I don't think you even need to necessarily use this Hobbes quote I think you can justify the framework either analytically or with other kinds of cards too about how like um threats to safety and security are like either consequentially bad or um in this case, it has more to do with, like, the obligation of a government. So either way, I think you can justify it in different ways. But I think this is a really interesting framework and, like, good way to take the topic. I think it's definitely uh, going to be more common. So the last neg framework we're going to talk about is communitarianism. And for those of you who don't know what communitarianism is, um, we have two cards here from... Etzioni, who is like sort of the leading author on communitarianism philosophy, um, especially like in more modern uh, communitarianism works. So <clears throat> communitarianism is just the idea of like um, promoting like community development. Um, and so a value criterion here might be something like protecting the community, promoting the community. And I think you can argue that the negative upholds this with like those arguments we talked about earlier about like com uh, positive community-based solutions. So jobs programs, after school programs, rat risk youth, etc. that you can use to justify um, the predictive policing model because it can help promote the community and help... Um, benefit the community you can also um talk about crime and the relationship to the community through crime you can also talk about again those high impact arguments we were talking about earlier like terrorism human trafficking drug trafficking etc those certainly impact communities greatly so i think i think communitarianism can like work with you know a lot of different um contention level arguments but i think this is probably the strongest way to take communitarianism and this is obviously how you would run it too. So in case you wanted some help on how you would run a communitarian framework, I would say that this is probably the way to go. Again, a value criterion of like protecting the community or something along those lines. So we've talked for about 55 minutes now. Um, I would say that I hope that this topic analysis was helpful to you and that you were able to use it as a starting point. So this should not be the end-all be-all. Please, please, please do your own research. There's so much research on this topic. Um, and we are we hope to help you with some of like the framework uh, research or some cards on the topic to get you a little bit started with some research. But there's so much out there. You, you should do your own. I hope that this was able to help you start thinking and writing and get some ideas and get those gears moving. Um, again, we're going to include all of the research as well as like samples for what the frameworks would actually look like in that doc in the description below. 
and all of the evidence and cards that I showed will be linked. So we'll have the link to the original source as well as like last name date. It's going to be cut the way it was cut in this presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to comment below or you can email us triumphdebate uh, at gmail.com or info triumphdebate at gmail.com. And please like and subscribe. Let us know if this is something you would like to keep uh, hearing from us. Let us know if you'd want to see more topic analysis from us. Um, and I hope that y'all have a really good March, April topic and that for those of you in the Ohio circuit who are competing at the state tournament, good luck to all of you. It's going to be fantastic and I can't wait to judge some of you.